Pain. Everyone has a story about pain. My story has to do with my hip. Well, at least I thought it was my hip. You see, for over a year, I experienced excruciating nonstop pain. Right here. Right, 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 right there. <laughs> Doctors told me that when you have pain right here, that it's not your hip, that it's your back. Hip pain is up front. Back pain is on the side. X-rays on my hip and my back show there was nothing wrong. My back was fine and my hip was worn out or I needed replacement. I tried everything to alleviate the pain. I went to pain doctors and, and I received that series of pain shots, you know, painful pain shots. I went to sports doctors who gave me physical exercises to do. I saw a chiropractor, a chiropractor. I saw an acupuncturist. I went to a deep massage therapist. I went to physical therapy. I applied cold, I applied heat, I meditated, I saw a psychologist. <coughs> Nothing helped. After a year of this, I went to the orthopedic surgeon who had replaced my knees and I said to him, operate on my hip. Put in an artificial hip. And he told me that the x-rays did not indicate that the hip needed to be replaced. And I told him I didn't care. Oh. Something is wrong. Please operate. Give me a hip replacement. The day of the surgery came. I received what's called a saddle block, which means I was anesthetized from the waist down. I was awake for the operation. I wanted to be awake. The doctor and I were actually talking with each other as he operated. He was telling me what he was doing as he was going. First the incision, then the separation of the muscles, then the sawing a part of the tibia from the ball, you know, the ball that goes into the socket of your hip. But then he goes to pull the ball out of the socket and he is surprised. And he actually says these words. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> now when you are on an operating table and you're awake, the main sound you never want to hear is uh-oh. <laughs> What's wrong, Doc? Well, he says, the ball appears to be, well, stuck. I've never seen anything like this before, he said. Your ball seems to be fused into your socket and it's fused in a very odd place in the socket. <coughs> then there was a long period of silence. <laughs> Sometimes I know when to keep my mouth shut, and that was the moment, because I could tell he was thinking about what to do next. Never in my wildest imaginations did I envision what came next. The good doctor showed me two surgical instruments I never would have guessed would even be in an operating room. He showed me a stainless steel chisel and a stainless steel hammer. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, you're definitely going to feel this. <laughs> Whack! 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 This went on for 20 minutes. Each whack separated by a purposeful pause where he was thinking where to whack next. <laughs> With each blow to the, to the chisel, my body jerked downward on the stainless steel table. The surgeon finally told the nurse and anesthetist, he said though, those words, you don't have time to object. They happen so fast. He said, give him some twilight. And before I could say, please don't do that, I was out. <laughs> when I worked, the surgeon was standing next to me with the ball in his hand. And he was turning it over and over and explaining to me what, what the story was. The ball, you see, had been affixed into the socket by these spikes. Spikes had actually grown out of the ball in all directions, and the spikes had actually grown into the socket, into it. The ball was also submitted into place by arthritis, and it was not possible for the ball to move around in the socket. Thus, when I walked, he said, my back muscles had to do the work of the joint. And what little muscle in particular, called the piriformis muscle, which is only about four inches long, was extremely swollen and irritated. That little muscle was screaming at me for a whole year that something was wrong. 
and was giving me the worst pain I had ever experienced. The surgeon put the ball, I was laying on my left side, so he put the ball in my left hand, and I looked at it for the longest time and wondered. It was still warm. The spikes had been chiseled off, of course, but you could see where they were, the outlines of where they were. The surgeon told me that he had never seen, heard, or read about anything like this. It was an anomaly, true anomaly. I got into him, and that pain that had been the bane of my life for over a year was gone. It just disappeared. Here's what I learned. God doesn't cause pain. God isn't sitting up in the clouds in some master control panel and saying to himself, gee, I think I'll give Bowen some back pain to punish him or teach him a lesson. That's not God. Nature causes pain. Accidents cause pain. People cause pain by the decisions they make. This wondrous world of ours and these wondrous bodies of ours carry with them the possibility of pain. Without that possibility, there is no freedom. There, is, there are no laws of cause and effect. We couldn't depend on anything. There's no independence. There's no co-dependence. God created nature to be independent of him. God is not nature. Pantheism. God is not nature. God created nature. It's outside of God. It exists on its own. That doesn't mean that God can't interfere with the course of nature. God is God, and God can perform miracles, right, Jeff? God is God. <coughs> Only miracles are the exception and not the rule. There must be divine purpose for there to be an intervention for God. We pray, we ask, sometimes God responds, sometimes God interferes with nature. Sometimes God is silent. We don't judge God, that's not our job. We don't judge God. God sees the whole. We only see the part. Like in a foggy mirror, said the Apostle Paul. My body malfunctions. A surgeon was able to help me. That's the story. But listen up. God was with me. And God was with me through that whole year of pain. And in all my trial and trouble. Here's how. God sent kind, loving, understanding people to listen to me to sit with me in my pain and to comfort me, chief of which was Susan. Without the people in my life, my friends, and the people who care about me, I would have felt so lost, so alone. Secondly, God gave me insight into empathic listening. We listen to other people, maybe the first five, ten seconds, and then our brains are engaged, and we start thinking about our response before the other person has even stopped listening, stopped talking. And we all do it. We're all guilty of it. Some of us more than others, and I'm certainly I'm guilty of it. But it, th this experience taught me, this pain taught me the importance of empathic listening, of truly listening to another person who's trying to tell me about what's happening with them. And to feed back to them some understanding, because you know we all want to be understood, don't we? We all want to be understood. <clears throat> I learned that everyone needs to tell their story, and that when someone's telling their story, it's a sacred moment, and we should treat it as a sacred moment and listen with empathy and respect. When someone tells me about their pain today, I'm more apt to listen with empathy and understanding that before my episode of pain, people need to share with others. In this sense, we need each other. God gave us each other, you see, to be a comfort to each other. Thirdly, I learned that pain can be a pathway to growth. I had another kind of pain. I suffered much in a bad marriage. But that pain I suffered has helped me appreciate the importance of a good marriage and of doing the things that make for a good marriage. We all suffer difficulties, all of us. We all occasionally make that bad decision with the disastrous consequences, and we all occasionally have things happen to us by accident or just by circumstance. And pain sometimes comes with it. But we have an opportunity to learn from pain and to grow and change because of pain. Do you remember when you were growing up and you had a little growth spurt, and it hurt. 
They call those growing pains. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> this little boy just raised his hand. <laughs> he knows all about it. But uh, uh, sometimes in our pain there's growth. If we if we if we ask ourselves, is there something, is there a lesson here I can, that can be learned? But you might say to me, but sorrow and pain seems to be meaningless. I propose to you that no pain is meaningless. If pain does not teach us, it surely helps us to have empathy for those who suffer. And it binds us to the sufferings of Christ. In the hours leading up to the cross, and then his hours on the cross. Imagine, suffering with Christ. Enduring the pain of agony on the cross for others, for those you love, in place of those who love you love. Imagine. All pain has meaning in this regard. I suffer with Christ for the sake of love. Any pain we might suffer in this life surely pales in comparison to the pain Christ felt as he suffered and died for all humanity. It was because God so loved By virtue of my humanity, a humanity in which Jesus shared, I share the suffering of Christ for others. What pain would I be willing to bear to save those I love? Our suffering with Christ on the cross is meaning enough. He suffered and died for me. What small burden of pain is mine? by comparison to such great love. What pain would I not be willing to lay on the altar of love? Finally, pain is a mystery. We will never fully comprehend. The pathetic shaking our fists at God and saying, why me, simply betrays an immaturity of faith. All pain, past, present, and future, requires faith to endure and to overcome. Sometimes the pain we feel in this life comes to an end, as it did in the case of my hip. I'm now pain-free, but at this moment. <laughs> ah, but can we say with Job, whether I live or whether I die, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm sure Job would gladly paraphrase that to read. Whether I am in pain or whether I am in no pain, blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you say that? Is your faith that strong? If not, this is where you must trust. You must trust the Lord to be with you in whatever circumstance you find yourself in. Put your hand in God's hand and walk into the unknown future. It is the only way forward without debilitating fear. Perhaps we should adopt the attitude of St. Teresa of Avila, a 16th century Spanish mystic. She said this, and I quote, When we accept what happens to us and make the best of it, we are praising God. For you see, I am never really free of some pain. I'm never really free of it until I cross over into the realm in which there is no pain. I read the promise in the book of Revelation with great wonderment, with great anticipation. We are going to a heavenly home where, quote, God wipes away every tear from our eyes, and there is no more pain. No more pain. It is a promise that makes me cling even tighter to the hand of God. Live is to feel pain. To be with God in eternity is to exist in a state of being that's beyond pain. <clears throat> is it any wonder that we have a picture of heaven where the saints are continually singing praises to God? <laughs> On that one point alone, I can sing praises to God for eternity. There is no more pain. Can you see why Paul classifies hope as an eternal truth? Faith, hope, and love abide. These three are eternal. These three. 
Put your faith in God. Love as God loves, and with or without pain. Claim that eternal hope of healing and wholeness in this life or in the life to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. There is a bomb in Gilead.